Let's take a look at Sony's newest gigantic 12 to 24 millimeter F 2.8. First off, for a $3,000 lens, it comes nicely packaged. It comes in this wonderful nylon case with Velcro and zippers. Although I never use these cases, they're nice, but I never actually use them because I just keep this lens in my bag and we're good to go. Probably one of the most innovative things about this, I mean less, it is super sharp, as is the 12 to 24 millimeter f4. Yes, the lens is ultra sharp, it's also ultra huge. To be honest, the most innovative new thing about this is this cap. I've been shooting ultra wides like this that, that have no ability to take a front filter, it's nothing but the glass, $3,000 worth of glass, or actually I owned one of the Nikon 13 millimeter f5.6s for over a decade, $30,000 lens with a four inch diameter fishbowl front element with no way to protect it. You're real careful shooting that lens. This lens has no protection, so the cap is critical. In the old days, these caps were metal and felt lined and they wore, went on tight. They could go on any direction, they were great. Lately, camera makers have used these crappy plastic caps that have to be aligned carefully and then only can you get them on. This cap is actually the most brilliant thing that's come along in 30 years, why? Well, sure, it's a plastic cap and it has these little push tabs, but here's what makes it special. You see the four tabs inside? They work in unison. There's a cam mechanism that works all four of these in unison anytime you press these. Why does it matter? Well, you'll notice we have felt on the outside. Now, when you push it on, you can push it on. You don't have to align it. Any direction, it clicks on. The other caps today, like the Canon 11 to 24 millimeter and other crazy wide lenses, including some of the other Sony ultra, ultra wide lenses, you have to be very careful and align this just right to the pedals? No, with this lens, this cap just goes on. And you think I'm making a big thing about something this little, when you actually own this and shoot it every day, that's a big thing because when I'm walking around, I'm always walking around with my hand over the front of the lens. So if I bang into something, I just hit it with my hand. I don't destroy my lens. Because another thing about this lens is with no ability to use a front filter, anything you get on this gorgeous, gigantic front element, you're gonna see in your pictures when you stop down because the depth of field is so extraordinary you really have to keep this front clean, which means you want to be religious about using your caps because you can't use a filter. So that's the best new thing about this lens, to be perfectly honest. Let's take a look at some of the pictures I can make. Here's a shot of the Seven Palms Oasis by Starlight. Now, the reason the tops of the trees are blurry is because this is a 30 second long exposure and the clouds, well, there are no clouds, but the stars, of course, have moved a little bit as well. But even at f2.8 at 12 millimeters here, the lens is super sharp from edge to edge and corner to corner, just like the 12 to 24 millimeter f4. That's not really the reason we buy this lens. We buy this lens because we need f2.8. Here's another shot of a fine home. Again, this is showing the lens at its absolute worst. 12 millimeters at f2.8 wide open. It's ultra sharp from center to edge. The only limitation is depth of field. Now on both of these images, I'm panning around them in my video editing software. I'm not making a video with the lens. I took a still photo, a 24 megapixel still photo of my A9 Mark II, and I'm just zooming around inside the pictures. In fact, this picture of the interior is so sharp, you might notice that there's actually aliasing. You see those color fringes on the grate? That's aliasing because actually each vein of that grate is so fine, it's hitting this one color pixel or the other in the Bayer matrix on the camera, and that's what leads to color aliasing. So this lens is ultra sharp. Another thing it does is it has fantastic sun stars. Now here's a sun star series, so to speak, at different apertures. This is wonderful. This is something the F4 lens can't do. One of the big selling points of my nature landscape picture shot with an ultra ultra wide is, is half the time the sun is gonna be in the picture because the lens covers such a wide angle. This lens has great sun stars. Even the top picture I showed you, the Seven Palms Away, so shot at f2.8, a little bit of a sun star. But if you play your cards right, at most apertures, if you've got a brilliant source of light, either an artificial point of light at night, like a light shining into your lens, or in this case, the sun shining at you, these sun stars are beautiful. Sony claims around the diaphragm, but I don't really think it is because around a diaphragm will make dull, soft sun stars. These are nice and sharp, which is fantastic. New about this lens compared to the other 12 to 24 millimeter f4 is there's a slot for a rear gel filter. Now it's funny, some of the younger people hearing about this lens had no idea what a gel filter is. We've been shooting these with gel filters since the 1970s when we started to get ultra, ultra wide lenses like the Nikon 15 millimeter f5.6. It's no big deal, you just cut out a gel filter to the right shape, slide it in here, and you've got filtration. 
Now, something to watch out for is you can't just take a gel from, say, a theatrical supply house that you'd use over lighting. Those are not really gelatin filters. They're not ultra flat. Those filters may or may not be sharp. In other words, they may or may not distort the image a little bit because they're made to be used over heavy lights. You want to use the Kodak gels. And, and look at my full review at KenRockwell.com where I have links to all these. You want to use the Kodak Rattan Gelatin Filters. They've been the laboratory standard for over 100 years. They're not cheap, and they're very, very delicate. You don't want to get a fingerprint on them or dirt or anything because you can't clean them off because they're a, a natural animal-based product. That's what gelatin is. But they are optically superior. So if you need to use a neutral density filter, you're set. You don't want to use a polarizer with this lens because the lens sees such an ginormous angle the polarization of the sky changes with angle. And what you'll get is you'll get a dark band across the sky and you'll be all confused and not know why it is because you probably wouldn't notice it while you were shooting it. But don't use a polarizer on an ultra, ultra wide lens. How do you use a neutral density grad filter? Well, in the old days, I'd either hold one over the front or you can just take a regular grad, a rectangular grad, and just hold it halfway over the front to move it as it is. Also, don't tell anyone this, I have actually used a little piece of tape and taped just half a grad over half of the back exactly where I want it and depend on the fact that it's not gonna be a perfect focus to give it a bit of a feather on an edge and that works too. Although with digital today, I'm used to shooting film on view cameras. With digital today, you can get away with a lot. The worst thing about this lens is it's offshored. It's Shanghai to China. That's really sad. Pay $3,000 for lens made in China. It's not even made domestically in Japan. Well, you can play your politics as you want, but I would much rather buy something from a non-communist country. A nice thing about this lens, a little fine touch is, there's a little rubber nubbin right here. There's a nubbin. So when you put it on your camera, I put it on my A9 Mark II, and you set it down, instead of beating the heck out of your furniture, your table, it actually sits on this nubbin, this little rubber nubbin. So that is a fine point that is actually a well thought out thing. Other than being made in China, there's nothing wrong with this lens other than the fact that it's big, heavy, and expensive. What's missing, it has no image stabilization. I'll cover that later. It has a front coating of fluorine on the, <laughs> on the element, so it hopefully stays a little cleaner, but guess what? Never stays perfectly clean, nothing does. It's still, it's still a physical product. There's no fluorine coating on the back. Autofocus is fast, but not instantaneous, but it's an ultra wide lens. It never has to focus that far. Manual focus is entirely electronic. This is an electronic encoder ring. It's never actually connected to anything except through your camera. So depending on your mode, it may or may not do what you want it to do. Focus breathing, which is important if you're making movies with this and focusing between a near actor and a far actor. You don't want the picture to slightly grow or contract. It makes it look like it's breathing. The image from the 12 to 24 gets a little smaller as focused more closely. And the effect is the most obvious at the 12 millimeter end and it's fairly minor at the 24 millimeter end. Bokeh, you've gotta be kidding me. A lens this wide doesn't really ever get anything out of focus. Everything's usually completely in focus and you have to go way out of your way as I did here to get anything a little bit out of focus. But because good, it's, it's neutral. Here's a shot at 24 millimeters at f2.8. This is about the softest your backgrounds will ever get. And actually, that's not bad. It's not disturbing, it's just the background. If you zoom out to 12 millimeters, you get even more depth of field. And so this is what you get at 12 millimeters. And again, I'm zooming in with my video editing software. These are complete images just shot out of the camera. Distortion is wonderful. The camera automatically corrects for distortion if you engage that, at least my A9-2 does. However, even without any correction, it's really good. At 12 millimeters, it's just the tiniest bit of barrel distortion, which is almost never even visible at 12 millimeters. There's no distortion at all around 14 millimeters. And then from 16 to 24 millimeters, it goes from minor to moderate pincushion distortion, but it's never even that obvious in a lot of cases. So it's certainly a super high quality lens. I'm really impressed with the electronic correction. They don't need to do as good a job on distortion correction as they do, but they did. Ergonomically, the biggest thing is, is no front filters, but you do have a good cap. And by no front filters, this is a, now a special purpose lens. You really can't just schlep this around all over the place and shoot everything with it because without any front filters, it's very delicate. It's easy to watch it here on YouTube in a sanitary environment or look at it someplace or look at your friend's lens. But if you're actually gonna carry this thing around all day long, you've got this big naked $3,000 piece of glass in front of you. It's not a practical lens. It's a lens that you wind up taking to a job, taking out of its case, shooting the job and putting back in its case. And what is this best for? The lens this wide is a very special purpose lens. 
The best use of this lens is architecture and interiors. It makes interiors look gigantic. It emphasizes and exaggerates the perspective from near to far, and it makes the properties you photograph look a lot bigger than they actually are, which is why I've always used lenses like this for my real estate listing shots because Realtors usually want to make the place look as attractive as they can. And this makes places, even outdoor spaces, look a lot bigger than they really are. And it emphasizes that and that's good. Other than that, the only really good thing you can shoot with the lens this wide are large interior spaces like Grand Central Terminal in New York City or Sony's public relations photographs shot inside a big theater. That's the really only good use of a lens this wide is to go inside, say, an ornate cathedral and take a shot. For general photography, this is an extremely limited lens and it's extremely difficult to use an ultra wide lens. On my website, kenrockwell.com, I have a definitive article on how to use ultra wide lenses, which can help. The key is you have to get close and use this to deliberately exaggerate perspective. Ultra wide lenses are never for getting it all in, which is what people think when they first start out in photography, like, oh, I wanna get it all in, it'll make a great picture. No, the more I've learned about photography in over 50 years of shooting, is that the more you put in your picture, the less it says. You want to have as little in your picture as possible. That's what photography is all about, is showing people what it is you're trying to show them, not letting the viewer figure it out. And zooming is mechanical, it's a traditional mechanical zoom. Thank them for that. Fall off is not a problem. If you just looked at all the pictures I showed you, shot wide open at f2.8, fall off is not a problem. Those are shot with the default fall off correction on in my A9 II. You might want to watch out if you go out of your way to turn it off. There will be some fall off in the corners, which you might want to use for artistic effect. It's strongest at f2.8 and strongest at the 12 millimeter end. Be forewarned. There are no lateral color fringes. The camera is usually correct for them automatically. But if you go out of your way to turn off the automatic chromatic aberration correction, there is just the tiniest bit, like a fraction of a pixel at 12 millimeters of red and blue fringing. There's none at 18 and 24 millimeters. That's extraordinary. Sony didn't have to make the lens this good because it corrects electronically, but they did. So I am very impressed. Macro gets close. It'll get about this close. It's rated to within like 11 inches, which is 11 inches measured from the image plane. So from the sensor, it'll get 11 inches like this close. But because the lens is so wide, here's what you get. And I'm gonna zoom in. This is at f2.8. It's really sharp, so that's good. But it's, it's not a macro lens. The reason you would get close with this lens is for special effects. If you wanna make something look really crazy, really force the perspective, that's what you do. And of course, this shot here at f8, it's even sharper. Mechanically, for the most part, everything on the outside is plastic. This is plastic, and this is not a hood. This is just a protector, so when you put it down, you don't destroy your front element. As you can see, it gets hit by the light from every direction. If you have a problem with flare, what we do is we take our hands and just block the light like that. This ring here is metal, but then these are plastic, plastic, plastic. The insides are mostly metal, and that's really what counts. So it is a well-made lens. There will be a lot of noise when you shake this lens because the autofocus groups don't lock down when you turn it off. So they, I don't know if you can hear that, but there's two autofocus groups on the inside. They don't lock, so they will flop around. Peripheral color shifts. This has been a <laughs> one of the evil little secrets of ultra, ultra wide lenses ever since they were invented because when the light hits it, different angles, the coatings work differently and affect different colors differently. Most ultra wides historically have gotten bluer in the corners. The great thing is this lens uses some special coatings and Sony has really gotten their hand on top of it. There's very little color shift. Even in my worst case shot here of a gray plate, it's still fairly neutral. As you've seen in the sample images, there's no visible shifting of color. For image stabilization, you really need to go to my website, kenrockwell.com and look at the review where I show sample image files you can download and look. With sensor shift image stabilization, it can correct in the center of the image, but because of the geometry of what's going on with an ultra, ultra wide lens like this, the sensor would have to move two times as far in the corner as it does in the center to correct the same image. Because maybe you've noticed how things sort of get sucked out or actually how things get stretched out on the corners of an ultra, ultra wide shot. In other words, if you have a globe in the middle, it looks round, but if it's off in the corner of your image, it looks like it's all stretched out this way. Well, the problem is, is for sensor shift image stabilization to work well, it has to do the same. However, it can't because the sensor is not made of rubber. So therefore, if you're getting blurry corners, shooting in low light and you think it's the lens, no, it's you moving. You need to lock down on a tripod. And I show samples of that. I show uh, samples at kenrockwell.com and this lens is review, which is linked also in my description. You can get a super sharp center, but you'll get soft corners because the image stabilization can't correct for the corners at 12 millimeters. That's just a limitation of the stabilization system.
And that's a quick look at the Sony 12 to 24 millimeter f2.8. Again, it's optically extraordinary, but not any more extraordinary than 12 to 24 millimeter f4. What really makes this lens stand out is its utility, is the fact that it has a cap that just pops right on, doesn't have to be adjusted, and then just comes right off with your eyes off so you can actually shoot this lens out in the field as opposed to just leave it home. It also has extraordinary sun stars, which is a real difference you can see. People new to photography get all excited about sharpness because they don't understand the sharpness comes from the mind of the photographer and how he shoots and what he shoots and where he shoots. It has nothing to do today with lenses, which are all sharp. But adding a sun star, as I showed, really helps make a picture sparkle. If you haven't asked yourself, should I buy this lens? Well, yes, you should. Let's face it, if you've got a stimulus check, it is a marvelous lens. It's one of a kind, there's nothing like it on Earth. It's the only 12 to 24 millimeter f2.8 zoom in existence ever in the entire history of the universe. And so it is a great lens. For practical shooting, to be honest, the 16 to 35 is a far more practical lens because not only is it smaller, lighter, and cost less, it also takes a front filter so you can take it out and beat on it and shoot it every single day. And also from a practical standpoint, New photographers don't realize that getting it all in and having 12 millimeters does not make this a better lens. It actually makes it a much less useful lens. If we look at this curve of utility versus cost, size, and weight, your 50 millimeter lens is the sharpest lens you can buy actually technically. It's also the most useful. It's also the least expensive. As you get longer beyond about 90 millimeters, lenses get more expensive and less and less useful. And when you get wider and wider, they become less useful, but far more expensive and far more weird. A 12 millimeter lens is almost completely useless, but extraordinarily expensive. So if you have to ask, please, you will thank me. Get the 16 to 35 millimeter of 2.8 or whatever you like. To be honest, most people don't even know how to use ultra-wide lenses. I have an article on that at kenrockwell.com and there's a link to that in my description. It's all about getting close. It's not about trying to get it all in. It's a marvelous lens, but it is a very special purpose lens. Thanks for watching Ken Rockwell, kenrockwell.com and kenrockwell.tv. And if you like these videos, the best way to support me is when you're gonna get your stuff is to use the links in my reviews. Thanks again for watching.